comments. As you know, it is brought to you by Skankti Inner City Ministries, better known as Sikkim. Uh, my name is Shirley Radine, and today we have for our guests, we have Debra, Debbie Smith from uh, exec, exec, Executive Director of Skankti Community Action Program, and we have Laura Perry from um, Skankti Community Action Program, known as SCAP, Director of Communications. And welcome to both of you. I'm so glad you could be here today. Thanks for having us. Thank uh, you. And uh, now, Skankti Community Action Program, better known as SCAP, where did that come from? Is, could you tell us a little bit about the history of that? I'd love to, actually. Um, well, the community action movement uh, started as very intertwined with the civil rights movement and other things, and, and it, was, it really gained momentum in the late 50s and the early 60s. Um, in the 50s, there was huge economic expansion in our country, and the ebbs and flows of that uh, as the decade went on, left more and more people behind, particularly minorities, mm -hmm. people with low educational attainment, uh, or people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So there began to be a social unrest around this uh, inequality, basically. Um, as that time went on, uh, about a million and a half uh, low-income blacks moved to the north, the cities in the north. The Great the Migration. Urban. That's right, right, the Great Migration. Yeah. Um, and with that, of course, whites were leaving the city and fleeing to the suburbs. Um, that created even more pressure on the urban centers because the standard of living was, was reduced. Mm. At the same time, our president at the time, uh, Eisenhower, was not a fan of government intervention, uh, especially in social policy. So really little to nothing was done uh, to support people as they were moving to the north or to do anything around equality. Um, so as the decade ended and we got um, late in the decade, uh, there was a growing movement of social unrest, mm -hmm. uh, very intertwined with a growing civil rights movement. Um, and then entered into our world was John F. Kennedy, who was running for president. And uh, he was very uh, enmeshed in these movements and he was doing uh, campaigning, particularly in the South and other poor areas. And he went to West Virginia, into the mining towns, and just saw extreme poverty. This was all having an effect on him. Mm. Uh, he decided to make poverty and really inequality uh, part of his campaign. So as time went on through his campaign, and fortunately he, for us, he was voted into office. Um, around 1962, there was a book that came out written by Michael Harrington called The Other America. And this book really compelled... I read that book, yes. Of course, yeah. many people yeah. who understand the history and know the history have read this book, and it really compelled the administration to deal with social injustice mm -hmm. um, through economic equality movements. Mm -hmm. And so at the same time, we had the Ford Foundation who wanted to invest some money in this and um, invested $20 million in what was called the Gray Areas Projects. And they invested that money in five urban areas across the country. Um, these were part of the first wave of what later would become community action Let's agencies. See. Yeah. So it, it's, uh, and then so of has course. A huge history behind it. It has a huge history yeah. behind it. And then of course the famous speech by Martin Luther King yeah. Um, the, the march in Washington that drew a quarter of a million people uh, further convinced the administration and Kennedy's administration that there needed to be a national poverty mm -hmm. policy. Um, and so he was moving towards that and then he was assassinated. Right. Um, Johnson, who uh, was the vice president and then became the president after Kennedy, of course, was assassinated, wanted it to be even a more widespread movement than what Kennedy had envisioned. And at some point, he actually promised that any community that wanted a community action agency could have one. Oh. So his um, first State of the Union speech in January of 1964 is when he declared an unconditional war on poverty. Oh, that's where that wording came from. That's where the wording came from, mm -hmm. uh, but who really put poverty 
into the homes of the people was the civil rights movement right. because night after night they were seeing it on TV, mm -hmm. the social injustice, um, and they were, Martin Luther King and many others were able to talk about the disparity between wages for blacks and whites, uh, the failure rates of black youth and all of this. And this all led to what eventually became the war on poverty and the community action movement. I see. Okay. Well, so then, uh, so that's w about 50 years ago, right? Are you about... S it's 50, 50 years, years ago. Yeah. You, but, <laughs> yes, we are. Uh, uh, SCAP uh, actually turns 50 this year. Are you having some plans for that? or We do have plans for that. Uh, the board is in the process of uh, creating a year-long plan. Uh, we're going to be rolling that plan out next month. May is National Community Action Month. Oh. So uh, Laura, who is our communications director, is working with the staff and the board to um, have a year-long campaign where we're sharing stories about SCAP. It sounds like your work is going to be cut out for you. Yes, it. our it's work is cut out for us. Um, what we hope to do is create 52 uh, uh, little snippets about the history of the agency and how we came to be and, and our services today and um, post one every week to Facebook and Twitter and our website and the social, social media. Uh, this is a great way to let the community and our partners get to know more about SCAP and who we are and what we do. So SCAP does have a, a, a face page and Twitter and we do. Twitter we do. and Hooter. And yes, all. we do. <laughs> uh, good, good. So that it's really easily accessed yes. to find that information. Absolutely, absolutely. And great. I would encourage our um, viewers to uh, like us on Facebook and they could learn more as the year goes on about um, the agency and the organization and our services. And then we hope to end our year-long celebration with a community speak out and that will be a sort of celebration wow. with our partners in the community. Nice. So. You know, speaking in terms of partnerships, um, some of your services you really do into, into partnership with other agencies, do you not? Yes, in fact, uh, I'm glad you asked me that because in the last three or four years, we have not started a new program that wasn't in partnership uh -huh. with another organization. Um, one of our oldest and most community trusted partnerships is with SICKM, the Community Crisis Network. Oh, um, yes. We began that around 15 years ago with SICKM and Catholic Charities, and that has grown to include the YWCA and city mission at that point. You might want to say a little bit about the community crisis because that's very important in this area mm -hmm. for people. Yes, about 15 or 16 years ago, we were seeing a surge in people who were in crisis and they were seeking out help from various congregations. Mm -hmm. um, and the members of those congregations were talking to SICKM and also Catholic Charities about uh, how to approach it. They didn't know what to do. Um, and so your executive director, Phil Grigsby, reached out to me. I had just become executive director. And um, so did John Steele at the time from Catholic Charities. And we sat down and talked about what a partnership clearinghouse, if you will, would look like. Mm. A place that people could go. Um, they would be assessed what their needs were. We would um, do our best to help them in their immediate need, and then we would refer them on, whether it was one of our services, one of the network services, mm -hmm. or another agency, for long-term supports. So it's almost like a case management program. It's first and foremost uh, an intervention program. Okay, right. We want people to know that when they're in crisis, there's someone there that wants to help, to help them. them. And then from there, once you ameliorate the crisis, people are more able to sit down and say, well, this is where I am and this is where I want to be. Uh, is there something that you can do to support me? Surely. And then the case management kicks in. Okay, I jumped ahead a little bit. But you I, did, yeah. Um, now, where would they go though? Is this housed at SCAP or is this housed, where is the house? Um, yes, we have counselors at 913 Albany Street. Mm -hmm. um, but they also, there's really no wrong door if they're at the food pantry they get referred over. Uh, we are also at the food pantry from time to time. But in the last couple of years, we've started to take our navigation of the system out. And so oh. we've been at Ellis, um, the campus at McClellan Street, right, right. for the last three or four years. Mm -hmm. And so people who are there for medical appointments can access the Community Crisis Excellent. Network. Excellent. Uh, later this month, we will be at the Downtown Library 
and we will be doing that one day a week. They have made space available for us and have welcomed us with open arms. Excellent. So if you're down at the library and you're in crisis uh, for other reasons, you can access our services. This is good to know. And um, I imagine it's got to be very frustrating for someone in crisis to go, say, to a church and the pastor says, well, I really can't help you. Right. And it's like, well, what do I do now? So right. this is, and, now and it was churches, painful for the they people. They know where to send the people. Exactly. Now. Yes, and it was painful for them too because the congregation wanted to reach exactly. out and help people. And I think a little frustrated that why do people have to roam around looking for assistance? Right. We, right. the congregation support the community crisis network, yep. um, and provide support for an emergency fund. Mm -hmm. And when all other services uh, have been exhausted and there's a need, we take money directly from that emergency fund. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'm glad we brought that up because I think that's extremely important that people know that there there are folks who are looking out for folks that really, really, really need help. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you said, there, there's an assessment piece to that. So it's not just running in and Here's, no, yeah. absolutely not. You, we do have everyone go through an assessment. Mm -hmm. We talk about budget. We talk about how you got into the crisis. Mm -hmm. um, but we also understand okay. that when someone's in crisis, they need to have that crisis handled. They can't spend day after day first talking about other yeah. things. It's uh, you can't you can't say well what you did was wrong. So therefore, absolutely, they, they there's need, no judgment. They need it's to just see a light at, at the end of the tunnel first. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, that's really good to know. Now, you know, I was reading, I tried to do a little homework about SCAP, and I was reading something about a long story short. Yeah. Yes. It's an interesting title. Thank you. Thank you. That's very um, clever. A couple of years ago, um, Laura came to me with an idea that has really changed the course of storytelling, mm. in our opinion. Uh, you want to talk about it? Uh, long story short, we, we launched it two years ago in May. Um, it it kind of came about as uh, SCAP had a need to convey to the public um, a, more about our services and our success. There's a lot of stereotyping and there's mm. a lot of myths around living in poverty sure. and we hope to dispel the myths and tell the truth about you know what happens and how um, SCAP has helped people and the stories are positive, they're about the success and the milestones that our customers have achieved. Um, this, the name of the campaign, it's a real quick funny story. My husband and I were chatting one evening and he was telling me about something and he goes, well, long story short, uh -huh. and then he finished his story and I, it just clicked with me. Long story sure. short, that would be perfect for the campaign at SCAP because I had been struggling with a title for the campaign. So anyway, we, we launched it in May, which happens to be National Community Action uh -huh. Month, so it was a good time to launch something like this. Um, we developed a poster. I believe that uh, you have a copy of the poster. I hope you'll show it on the um, air so people can see our poster. Um, the goal, or we hope that the campaign will, like I said, dispel the myths and the stereotypes that surround poverty. Can but I say you're putting a human a human. Absolutely. Right. These are their stories. That's their yes. stories. Yes, they're basically telling their story. And this is a place I could be any day, or you could be any Absolutely. day. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I Absolutely. think we wanted to really convey that it's a it's a complicated issue. Right. And as Laura said, you know, we had a lot of concern about the negative stereotyping yes. that had been going on. I mean, it doesn't happen as much in Schenectady as you see on the national landscape, but we knew there were positive, uplifting stories that people had, but that in telling their story, um, they're owning it, first of all. We're not telling it for them. They're telling their own stories, so they own it. And also people could see that it's much more complicated. Well, there definitely. are a lot of reasons why people Surely. end up in crisis. And I, and I think as what happens, what seems to happen nationally, <clears throat> maybe not so much here, is that as the economic picture depresses or gets harder, then people begin to look at those, point at the quote stereotypes. It's their fault. They don't only right. Pull, right. If they'd only pull their weight, this and that. Right. So you hear those kinds of right. things. And I think it's just great that you're putting a, 
uh, making people see that these are human beings. Mm -hmm. This is you or I, folks. Right. Yeah. Right. And what you say is exactly the issue because it ebbs and flows with the economy, which is also a very complicated mm -hmm. thing. Yes. And so you can't. Um, when Community Action started 50 years ago, we had a national poverty rate of 22%. In the first few years of Community Action, it plummeted. However, as we both mm -hmm. know and understand, there's a difference of opinion in our, in our government about what interventions, if any, should be done by, by our government. And so as those ebbs and flows changed, Money was cut off, even though we had great success in the beginning. There was a lot of cuts to it, and it's and it's, and it's starting and again over time. now again that that yeah. sense of, uh, um, I think, uh, I think Martin Luther King spoke to it as um, the stinginess of that we're willing to fund wars, but we become very miserly when we want to fund people. Yes, right. and that is exactly, I think, what we run into. But we also, one thing is, I think a lot of people believe that there is already enough resources mm -hmm. in the network. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens is that we are helping people ameliorate it um, or, or lessen the effects, but it takes a larger event to make for, it, yeah. to really to make, make a change event. going forward so right. that there's fewer poor people. It takes jobs, it takes you know, a housing market that people can afford. Well, and, and stop me if I'm wrong, but sometimes the system itself creates barriers that people can't dig out of where they are because if they make a step ahead, then this gets cut. And if they make another yes. step, something else, and so all of a sudden they're back where they started because they just, there's a this gap that's always there that doesn't get filled. Am I, I, you are absolutely correct. I've been saying for a long time that it's much more effective if we band together mm -hmm. and attack those things on the state or national level than ever going at each other here locally. Yes. Um, you know, in the early days, we were doing things like marching down to the Department of Social Services. Mm -hmm. But quite frankly, those are not policies of the Department of and Social Services. Those are federal policies that are passed down. And that's why in the King days, he had the really, really right idea. We have to make this a national effort. We right. all have to unite. It and needs to be a national it dialogue. Not only needs to be national, but it needs to not be a them, us and them. Um, <clears throat> when you talk about poverty and this whole new working poor, whatever that's supposed to mean, mm -hmm. um, the, if people can come together on a common issue, all of us have need. And we need to go to the head where, where the policy is really made. And, and um, right. I think right now we're in kind of scary times because the policies are beginning to shift again. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I, I believed when our current president, Barack Obama, came into office, he did start out early on making some strong statements right. about recovery and how that affected people in poverty. But I do feel that as time has gone on, he hasn't really kept Absolutely. it in the forefront and he hasn't really developed a national policy. What's happened is that other groups who might have more of a negative feeling of it have been better in mm -hmm. their communication so of it. So they've hijacked the, the, the emphasis and the time, yeah. They have, just made, they have just been smarter about how they've communicated right. it, so that's what we're hearing. Speaking of communication, <laughs> yes. But no, I, I agree with that and, and I just wanted to really um, uh, let you talk about that long short because I think that, the long story short, because I think that um, the more we can humanize these right. issues, the better it is, and, and not have it be um, so distant from people. Well, they, and yes, you know, like they is us, folks. They mm -hmm. is us, right. Well, the woman in our poster, her name is Crystal, and not only was she incredibly brave in the face of her story as she was living it, mm -hmm. um, she was incredibly brave after it by, a, you know, telling her story, being willing to have her story put out there, and she's become very successful. Um, and she is living independently and taking yeah. great care. She always did take great care of her child, but now she is living um, independently. I'm sure she continues to run into the everyday struggles sure. of making ends meet, um, but she is no longer, uh, she was very proud of the fact that she's not dependent on assistance. I was just going to say, what a sense of pride she was. Very yes. very pride. She and she a lot of pride. People, most when she do, first came to SCAP, she was homeless oh. and with a baby. And um, so she came into one of our transitional housing programs and uh, 
then she moved in to um, enroll in one of our career readiness classes mm. and was able to get on track to become a certified nurse assistant. And so um, that launched her into a career, not just Excellent. a job yes, with yes. minimum wage, but more of a career type of opportunity. And she allowed her to get an apartment, and she's doing very well. And like Deb said, she's very proud of you know the work she's done. And, and she's young, so I mean, she still has her life she's before got the whole, her. And she's modeling for her child, too. That's right. That's breaking that cycle mm -hmm. uh, that people talk about mm -hmm. all the time. And I, I just think it's important for people to understand most people do not want to have to be, have, take services. Right. Most right. people want to have that sense of pride. I'm doing this on my own. Right. And, and um, um, contrary to the the myth that well they they like being there and and that that's their that's their lifestyle it's not it's a myth it's, it's i mean myth. people people do not they want to be able to take care of themselves uh they are feeling that they're desperate and so one of the things that we understand at scap and i feel like all of our close partners share this philosophy which is why we partner with them if they didn't we wouldn't oh, sure but it's about treating people with dignity exactly um and by the grace it's not you it's them it could be you it, it could, could be, be anybody yeah. so we take that really seriously and we we do put the treatment of all of our customers first and foremost now you mentioned a couple of programs and um so we haven't talked really about services and uh, you started kind of <clears throat> alluding to that by saying this woman went through these various. So would you like some services that you'd like to identify? That I would. We really feel like we have a continuum of services. But one of the things that actually began in this community and is still going strong today is Head Start. Mm. Um, in 1965, for the first two years of Head Start, it was in the school district, a summer program only. Yes, yes. And then we worked with the school district to transition it to SCAP, and it was a full year program mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. um, now we've expanded it. Um, it's, it's really a full complementary early learning program for children from actually now we're proud to say zero birth to five. Really? We just added, we're very, very proud of this. This is something we worked on for a long time uh, through a partnership with the YWCA and Albany Community Action Partnership oh. and two local family daycare providers we were successful in applying for Early Head Start Child Care Partnership. So, um, now, what we're in does the, that entail? What that entails is it's Early Head Start and uh, Child Care blended together. Mm. So, as we know, it's really very difficult to make a daycare program viable. There yes. isn't a lot of money in the community. Mm. Well, the YWCA happens to do that very well, and they are uh, well regarded. And so, we partnered with them to bring in Early Head Start money which will help to um, ensure that when a, when a family receives some daycare subsidies, there's an ebb and flow. First of all, it's been yeah. cut significantly really at the bad. federal and state yes. level. Uh, so the county is very limited in how much they can offer. Uh, this will help to stabilize their care for the entire year. Excellent. Whether or not they lose a subsidy, um, they will continue to receive services. So that's stabilization for the child. Mm -hmm. It's stabilization for the family as a whole. If they're working, they don't have to worry about losing their job. And obviously, if they're in daycare, it's because they're working. And their child is safe and in good Your, your good child daycare. is safe. There's, it's a yeah. curriculum-based program. Right. It's not just playing outside. Yeah. Um, it's Watching a very well-regarded. Yeah. Yes, it's a, it's a very well-regarded curriculum. And we are able to connect the services from birth all the way to when they go to kindergarten. Mm. So we're really proud. We're just starting That's that exciting. now. Very I'm excited so glad about you brought it. that up because that is very, and um, so um, you have a variety of sites or is it all at your location? Uh, no, actually um, <laughs> the, the two daycare sites that we're in the process of opening in Schenectady are the YWCA's oh. existing sites. They have one on their Washington, at their Washington right. Street building, and the other one is at SCCC. Mm. Um, and then there'll be, there's two family child care homes that we're in the process of getting going. They're also in Schenectady. Um, not ready to yet announce them. Where are they? Right. 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 We're, not, sure. we're not quite at Still that negotiating. point. Yeah. And then there's sites in Albany. There's one site in Albany as well. I think it's exciting that the Albany piece is in there because so many times we've become so siloed that we don't reach out 
to other communities. And so that's, right. that's really exciting. Right. It's much yeah. larger. I, although what happens in your neighborhood and next door to you is the most important thing in everyone's world, we yes. really have a much bigger world exactly. that we're contending with. And, exactly. and so also it's very competitive. This was highly, highly competitive. There were only a few In grants. order to get the grant? Yes. There wow. were only a few given in the state of New York. Um, and so we believe by partnering with Albany that also they also have a great record. Right. Uh, it it allowed us to be successful, you know and what? certainly partnering with an existing child care provider with the reputation that the YWCA has. And they're an did accredited too. program. Yes, they I are. Understand. Yes. Yeah. So we're able to bring our expertise to the table uh, because we've been doing Head Start for 48 years. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and we'll be able to provide families with support services with family engagement specialists, as well as OT, PT, therapies. Right, right. And well, and, and also we're back to they can access other services parent where they Correct. where you perceive they're needed you can right. refer them oh by the way like the education pieces and that mm -hmm. so that that's right. really really i'm just so glad you were able to come and and share these things with us um, thank you do you have anything else that something that's coming up that you'd like to speak about or anything that well the biggest thing that's happening for us is our 50th anniversary right. um i just wanted to put out there i actually have the names of the five individuals from schenectady who originally incorporated Community Action. Oh. They are responsible for Community Action being in Schenectady, in Schenectady. County. Um, and so I just wanted to say their I names in would. case anyone's yes. listening. Yes. Um, their names are Harriet D. Murphy, Donald J. Sales, oh, that, yes. Mary R. B., spelled like the, oh, Mary the Bumblebee. Oh, Mary B., she was the, um, the um, uh, com uh, advertising person, or yes. okay, and Don Sales was the superintendent of the schools at one time. Yes, I've been uh, around Reverend a Alan while. Brown. <laughs> oh yes, and Jacqueline A. Hurley. Oh, oh so I just want to give word. a personal shout well, out to them and their families, and it's because of them that community action awesome is here community and flourishing. People. They and, really of course, were. we have wonderful people who have been involved, were involved in the early days, too, mm -hmm. that we're hoping to be able to recognize so you're over the next bring year. bring some of those people, like an alumni kind of We'd a like to, situation. Yes. That's yes. exciting. I, I'm just, I, I'm just <coughs> so thrilled that you were able to take the time out to come here. And do you have anything else you'd like to add, Laura? Uh, no, thank you. I'm just glad to be here. Thank you for the time. We okay. really appreciate it. Oh, good. Well, I'm sure that uh, you may be hearing from people who who weren't aware of how large an organization you are and the services that you provide. Mm -hmm. You may be getting phone calls and things. I hope so. People can go to our website. It is www.scapny.org um, and check us out there. They're, they're Please welcome to call us at any point. And your phone is? Our phone number is, our main office phone number is 374-9181. Our services on Albany Street are open from 8.30 to 4.30, Monday through Friday, until 6.30 on Wednesdays. Oh. So we would welcome people to visit us. Well, I thank you, and I thank you so very much for Shirley, being here. Shirley, thank you. This you make it so just, easy. Just thank great. you, Shirley. I look forward to... Um, Maybe having you back sometime. Thank you. We'd love especially that. Especially hearing the results of your anniversary. Thank you. That's exciting. And thank you very much. So, um,